I'm here with Pierce Steele, who's the author of The Procrastination Equation, and it's a book about why a lot of us delay doing the tasks that we should be doing. And Pierce is a professor at the University of Calgary, and I'll start the question by asking, one of the points in your book about procrastination is it seems to be linked in some cases to a lack of confidence. Yeah. It, so, so maybe you could elaborate on that. Well, not some people have this. You can be a yeah. procrastinator and still be confident. But if you lack self-confidence, you're most likely your procrastination is more extreme. Um, there is some cases in the other way, we can actually be overconfident. But for the most cases, it's actually underconfidence. And people who doubt themselves, who think, you know, this probably isn't going to work, or what's the point, and they have this kind of negative type of self-talk, they're more likely to put off the associated task. And what can somebody who lacks confidence do to, to um, perhaps give them more confidence and procrastinate a little less? Well, there's a lot of common sense, and just because it's common sense doesn't mean it was wrong. So it's, but the most powerful thing you can do is something called a success spiral because experience is actually the greatest teacher in this case. The question is a bit of a catch-22. If you can start getting ex successes under your belt, it'll embolden you to actually do something more. But how do you get that first success to actually start yourself going? Mm -hmm. And in this case, it's really kind of like seeing something just beyond your kind of what you're presently feeling capable of. And once you've done that, and you actually get that accomplishment, and then you can actually will help you kind of strive for the next one. So it's, in this case, success does breed success. And in another way, nice. failure does breed failure. If you, some people, for example, when they're making New Year's resolutions, they, they are not setting themselves up for success. They have unrealistic expectations. They want to shoot for the moon. And when they don't reach it, they feel like failures. And they're actually going downwards. It's a, it's a failure spiral. Well, if, let's say a lot of people are, have a New Year's resolution to quit smoking. Yeah. Can you give me an example of what a success spiral would look like if you were trying to quit smoking? Well, I'll, I'll start with the other way and then we'll go it. Okay, a failure spiral will say, if I'm gonna quit smoking and if I ever, if I ever smoke again, uh, then I failed and I'm a loser. <laughs> and actually having quit smoking um, like 20 years ago, I actually, actually know a better way about going about doing it. Uh, focus on kind of keeping your periods of uh, abstinence where you refrain from smoking to be longer and longer. And if you slip up, don't have what's called, a, it's called an abstinence violation effect. And people just binge smoking, you know, and just falling, they fell off the wagon, they don't even try and get back on. You had a smoke, try and have half that smoke. Try and say only have half of it and cut in half. Or if you really need to take a puff of a cigarette, just have one puff and put it down. So keep track, for example, the time between smokes you want that to be longer, and the number of smokes you have, you want that to be smaller, and it'll take care of itself. So, oh, you look, so that's a success yeah, spiral. Yeah, that's a success spiral. You're taking for mm -hmm. fewer violations, and when you actually do you know, give in, you want the violations to be less extreme. If that first number goes up and the second number goes down, you'll get there. Well, can you give an example how that could work for somebody who's trying to lose weight? Um, well, I, I, exactly, same yeah. with dieting. Yeah, and, on a diet. You know, we, you yeah. know, you, first of all, make it a reasonable diet. Some people have themselves on huge caloric restrictions, and it's, it's a grim and unenjoyable life, and it's not something you can really maintain. Mm -hmm. You go back and you actually kind of make something a little bit more reasonable, and actually what I would suggest, the first thing you should do in your diet is build in your treats. Say, okay, when, what treats do I deserve? And then you actually build those for these things. Something you say, I can commit to this diet. Then after that, you start putting in, for example, you know, what, how many salads, how many kind of lean chicken breasts and all these other things you're going to do. Once you've done that, once you've actually set yourself up for something that, that you can kind of commit to, something more reasonable, then you're more likely to be a success. And if you find yourself violating, let's say you're taking a, you know, a spoonful of dessert, you know, because you're at a party and you're having a good time, can you cut that in half? Can you share? Can you limit the damage there in the moment? A lot of people feel once they have the first, you know, piece of pie, they'll want to finish off all the rest of it. So it's simple things like that. It's common sense, but effective. Another thing you talk about in your book is the relationship between procrastination and impulsiveness. Yeah. And can, can you talk about the research in that area and what, what, what you've learned? Yeah, well, way back when, in about 30 years ago, we used to think it was because we we're perfectionists. And it's not the case. We actually perfectionists procrastinate a little bit less rather than more than other people. 
So actually, your perfection is actually insulating you somewhat from your, from your procrastination. What the real driver is, again, is impulsiveness. And it's, we're all impulsive. I mean, the human race is impulsive in the sense that we value short-term rewards inordinately more than long-term ones. So something that you can get right now, an immediate but small reward, and this could be something as small as, say, Minesweeper or Solitaire on the computer. It's, it's almost frivolous entertainment, but it's right there. And we'll do that instead of actually kind of getting our work done quickly and getting out and then meeting our friends at a bar or going to a party or doing something you really would enjoy. And this is really the biggest enabler of our procrastination because we live in a world now where we have all these rewards, all these temptations, and they're all instantly available. Consequently, if, for example, every uh, terminal, every internet connection is turned into a kind of a virtual strip club casino <laughs> and leisure room. We're wondering uh, why let, we procrastinate more. A, a, a virtual strip club, yeah, yeah. They, they, leisure room, and casino. casino. That's right. Well, actually, most most um, Al dot websites get their traffic from the nine to five crowd. So you know, we can that I'm 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 pretty sure that's not work related. So for a manager who's faced with you know these constant distractions yeah. that are uh, created by the internet, what advice do you have? Well, the simplest thing, and if you can, not every workplace can afford to do this. If you, some people need always instant email access. All right, so be it. You live in a kind of a really difficult place to work with. But if you can, turn off your email notifiers. Turn off the ding, turn off the ring. I mean, we, right now we almost have a Pavlovian response. It rings and we stop whatever we're doing, even if it was important, wonderful, productive work, and check our email. And no more often than not, that email is useless. It could have been totally ignored for hours upon hours. Instead. Check it during natural breaks in your productivity. So after all the kind of motivational juice has been extracted from what you're working on and you find yourself naturally distracted, then go and look at your email. People who do this, they get about another 10% productivity in their day, and that acts, adds up to an over an extra month a year. And you're clearly passionate yeah, about well. procrastination. And I'm just wondering, where does the passion come from? Well, um, you're exposing me here. Yeah. I, the, a reformed procrastinator, mm -hmm. that would be me. I mean, some pe a lot of people say procrast well, research is me-search. You know, why did I choose this topic? Well, because it resonated with me, of course. And having studied it for so long, you know, now coming up to 12 years, you know, I've got a really good understanding about what causes procrastination and what doesn't. And I just can't stand another person telling me it's because of perfectionism, because it's not. And what are the economic consequences of procrastination? Uh, well, with most people, by their own admission, saying it's about over two hours of their workday, and that's after lunch and regularly scheduled breaks, you can estimate it just on the surface about a quarter of everyone's salary. So if everyone's getting paid about $40,000 a year, that's $10,000 per person. But actually, I consider that's an underestimate because you can actually see, for example, are you putting that money towards savings? Are you actually preparing for your retirement? And most people aren't. About 80% say by they don't, haven't put enough away for the golden years. And then you actually go back and look at the governments. Are they putting, preparing for kind of tomorrow? Or do they have an idea of cutting down debt? And you have federal debt and you have provincial debt. And these are also increasing. So actually, when you actually put this final figure, um, for example, we calculated for the United States, and it actually comes up to seven, several trillion dollars. Wow. That's with a T per year. One of the issues we're procrastinating on is addressing climate change. That's right. Can you talk about any advice you'd have for society or for governments in terms of stopping procrastinating and addressing the problem before we're all living at the North Pole? There's actually a section in my book about that. Um, one of the things that we respond to is immediate feedback. And this is a problem with climate change. I mean, we're just not, even though we rationally understand that there is, um, you know, and this is not, there's actually a whole host of environmental problems. In fact, Freeman Dyson, who actually is, doubts climate change, still says we are actually making our world into a slum by not being able to deal with environment. So even though he might actually disagree on this one issue, he still agrees with on the theme that we are not really capable of kind of thinking about these long-term consequences in the short term. You have to address so it. So it's the same dynamic. Same dynamic. So one of the ways of actually doing it 
is by making the short-term consequences, take the long-term and make the short-term consequences of that palatable. Um, for one thing, for example, they've, instead of putting your meter, your energy, your electrical meter on the outside of the house, if you put it on the inside and you show exactly how much it's, call, it's like a, almost like a cab, how much your actual your dollar is going up with having all these lights on, people voluntarily, they choose to, hey, I'm going to cut down the amount of electricity. Because it's like coupon clipping. You made it tangible in front of your face. If you do the same type of thing for cars, so instead of having consumption, just saying, this is how much your idling is actually costing you right here, right now. People no longer have to feel virtuous. They'll naturally want to actually turn it off so it's and save money. giving them feedback. It's giving them feedback okay. in the short term. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate it very much. I've been speaking to Pierce Steele, professor, University of Calgary, and the author of The Procrastination Equation.